why yes I am wearing the same outfit as I did in the last video because I shot them on the same night and I'm out of clean clothes to change into because I've been traveling for two weeks. So thanks for noticing. Hi, I'm Kevin. I like to talk about queer stuff in Jesus and today we're gonna talk about a little something called theological catfishing and uh, why a little something called clarity is reasonable. Let's go. Theological catfishing. What do I mean by that? It's when you go to a church or you're part of a Christian organization that you believe to be welcoming, affirming, like on board with like all the same things that you're on board with, only to find out that their niceness is only a thinly veiled way of actually trying to convert you to being straight, to being conservative, to having a very particular view of the world. For example, let me use my story. I was attending a church here in Atlanta, a nice little hipster, cute little church thing for a while. I was going there for like maybe six months. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna commit. I'm gonna be become a member. I became a member and then I started taking a new member course and I sat down with one of the pastors and I said, hey, I'm gay and I'm someone who's really passionate about ministry and wanting to advance, you know, the kingdom of God for the goodness of the world, blah, blah, blah. Um, am I ever gonna hit any um, barriers here? Because I looked on the website and they, you guys don't mention anything about your view of marriage or about your policies surrounding LGBTQ participation. And I quote to you, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary friends, I asked that question and he said to me, yeah, we want you here. You're valued here. Your story is important. We think that you might be a part of this larger conversation around sexuality and gender that we want to have. You don't have to worry about hitting any glass ceilings here. I'm thinking, wow, that's amazing. This is like a church that feels like very welcoming. It's got amazing music. It's got, it's doing really good work like in relation to women's equity and really good work surrounding things around racial justice. And I guess the next conversation they're about to be on the brink of is the LGBTQ question. Great, if I'm not gonna hit any um, sort of barriers, I'm just gonna act like there's no barriers because I was just told there are no barriers. And here comes the part uh, that I like to call, that many people call the bait and switch and what I like to call theological catfishing. You know, went through the process of becoming a small group leader, started a small group, two weeks into starting a small group, which we had like 35 people show up. That's not a small group, that's a small a church plant right there. But what do I know? I'm just somebody who's been an evangelical world for far too long. But it's really successful and I get pulled into this meeting where they say, hey, Kevin, uh, I'm so sorry, but we can't actually let you lead because that would be the leadership making a statement um, that we're just not prepared to make yet. And I sat there and I was really confused because literally mere weeks before I was told by the same person that I was wanted there, that I was important, that, my, that like, I mattered and that I wasn't gonna hit any glass ceiling. So did he just think that like, like, I don't know what he was thinking, but either way, there was something that was told to me. I was told that I was welcome and I was equal. And then here's the practice saying, actually, no, you're not because you're gay, because you are a queer person, because you uh, are different than us. Um, we can't allow you to do that. Honest to goodness, like I was more qualified than half the bozos in that room who stood up to be a small group leader. I've been in ministry my whole fucking life. I've been a worship pastor for five ever. Um, I was a missionary for a long time. Like I, knew, I know how to lead. I know how to facilitate group virtual growth. That's what I'm passionate about. That's what I want to do with my life. But apparently because I like to kiss boys, that suddenly disqualifies me. Huh. And I think the thing that was most frustrating to me is that uh, if that's the policy of this church, why isn't it clearly stated somewhere? Why, have, why is nobody aware of what the policy is? Why is it being implemented differently for different people? Because I knew that other LGBTQ people were serving as volunteers in the church um, in different capacities, but so why is it that being a volunteer Bible study leader was somehow different? in that capacity. You see what I'm talking about? It's what I call theological catfishing. It's where a church sets you up to make you believe that you are completely welcome, affirmed, wanted, needed in those spaces, but at the end of the day, they have a policy of exclusion. Even if it's not written down, there's still a practice of it. So even when a church says, we don't have a policy, yeah, you do. You have a policy, you have a practice, and I can bet, I can ask any gay person in your church what that, what that is, and they'll probably tell me it's probably exclusion. But most people, when they have those moments, choose to leave those churches, and I, uh, either because I'm a martyr or a glutton for punishment, I don't know, 
Um, I decided to stick around for about two years and I continued to push the questions. I was like, hey, like, what can we do to, to make it a safer space for queer people? What can we do to make this church a space that can really accommodate everybody's spiritual needs? They started mentioning LGBT stuff from the platform, little baby bites here and there, but like it was some, any progress is progress. I talked to them about uh, me starting a, another house church thing that was made up of mostly queer people. They said, that we're excited to know about this. We're excited to hear about this. Tell us more. Tell us how we can be supportive of it. Three or four months into that, um, we basically are told you can no longer meet in um, this certain pastor's house who was hosting us. And also, we're adopting a policy of exclusion. We're adopting a traditional uh, policy around marriage and what we define marriage as between one man and one woman, and blah 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 blah. And I was so confused because for two years. I was in meetings with these people, I was in relationship with these people, I was going to, to parties and celebrations with them, like we were doing life together. We were crying with each other when tragedy struck, we were trying to like think of ways to make our city better, and then at the end of the day, like, this is what happens? You told me, you went, and like, I, I shit you not, in the meeting where he was telling me that they were adopting a non-inclusive a non-inclusive policy, he said, well, our heart is just to listen to more stories. The oils are bored. They just want to listen to more stories. They want uh, to really understand the heart behind blah, blah, fucking blah. And I said to him, I said, I don't think that's true. Because if you wanted to listen to more stories, I have made myself more than available to you. There are other LGBTQ people at our church who made themselves more than available to you. And what you're doing is you're making a policy that directly affects people like me and doesn't direct, like it doesn't affect you at all. So you're making a policy that has, that will never change your life, but it's going to change mine drastically. Then it's fucked up. I was so, I was so upset. I was so angry. And that happens way, way, way too often to queer people who are going into church space. We go into these churches, we're told, you're welcome here, we want you to be here, your story's important, you're a unique and special beloved child of God. And then when it comes down to it, when we ask for something, when we ask to lead, when we ask to become a volunteer on something, when we ask to be baptized or take communion, if our partners and us can get married in those churches, we're told, oh, actually, you know, no, not really, no. And then we're just blindsided by these exclusive policies when we were told the entire time we were welcome. And that's not fair. There's real people getting really hurt out there. Like if you remember a couple weeks ago when Justin Bieber had said like Justin Bieber consoles gay fan. The story was like Justin Bieber consoles gay fan um, who was hurt by the church and says, yeah, you can come to my church. My church is welcoming and blah, blah, blah. Actually, Justin Bieber, your church is not affirming. I think Justin Bieber goes to like uh, Judas Smith's church. I think City Church. And City Church is a non-affirming place. And if it's Hillsong, they're also non-affirming. Uh, Bethel, non-affirming. Um, Elevation Church, non-affirming. All of the big mega churches you know across this country are, I'm 99% sure all of them are non-affirming. They'll never talk about it. You have to like basically peel back eight layers of the internet to find any sort of policy, if any, about them, to find any sort of sermon notes um, about what they define as marriage or LGBTQ participation. Um, and it's just shocking to me, which is, and so queer people are going into these spaces looking for spirituality, looking for genuine connection with people. And then at the end of the day, they realize that they're about to get their hearts broken because who they were created to be is not welcome in those spaces, is not celebrated in those spaces. Which is why I think, and so many of us around the internet are saying something along the lines of clarity is reasonable. There's a really dope organization that started, I believe like last fall, called Church Clarity. And what they do is they score churches based on their policies, either spoken or unspoken, and basically asking to them to just define what their policies are. Not to change them, not to, to, to challenge them in any way, but just to say out loud, hey, we wanna know, do you affirm same-sex relationships and marriage? Would you marry a same-sex couple in your church? Would you hire LGBTQ people, baptize them? Can they become members, etc.? Really straightforward, black and white, yes or no, answers so that people can avoid what I went through at my church, which is a ton of heartbreak, a ton of wasted time, and a ton of shattered relationships. People across the board have a right to know what a church's policy is concerning LGBTQ people, uh, our participation in, uh, in the church, um, and how you see us.
Because at the end of the day, I don't want to go to a church that's only going to half value me. I want to know from the get-go, do you want me? Am I valued? Uh, can I fully participate in this space? Now, some people would call that divisive, asking people to be forthright about what they actually believe, but I would like to call that honesty, you know? I think it's, uh, it's pure, like, there's nothing wrong with honesty, because you know what, the truth can set you free. And the truth in this matter is that there's a lot of LGBTQ people, and people in general who are getting hurt by ambiguous policies, um, people are looking for places to belong and then are just finding out that they never they never could. And that to me is bullshit. All you churches out there, you might think that you're loving and, a, and welcoming and all that shit, um, but you're catfishing. You're theologically catfishing folks and telling them that they belong and they really don't belong to your white, straight, heteronormative congregation. So my challenge to y'all is uh, be clear about what you believe and uh, what your policies are. I don't even care why you believe them, um, as far as like a church organization level is concerned, I'm con I'm concerned that you just are telling the truth about what you do believe. So that's what I gotta say to that. So comment below, has this ever happened to you? Have you been theologically catfished before? And if you like this video, go ahead and like, share, and subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, connect with me on social media, the links are below. And if you think this video is important and you wanna make more like it, you can become a supporting partner on Patreon. Um, even as little as one or $2 a month helps make more queer Christian content possible. Okay, I am going to go drown my sorrows in a sour beer and probably go to sleep in a little bit because I have been on the road for two weeks and I haven't slept at all. I love you so much. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you again. Bye.